<laughs> Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Fellowship Friday for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Woohoo! Thank you, Jesus, for another day. Another day of uh, living and being blessed and having this fellowship. I'm um, looking forward to this tonight. Uh, and I know that Matthias is there in the background. I hope he'll be able to participate uh, to, uh, to a certain extent. Even though he's a multitasker, he's able to work and uh, be here too. Uh, we've got Brother Dave here with us. Uh, Sister Paula is also with us, or she will be with us any minute. And well, let's see who else is going to join us uh, as we as we proceed. Um, okay, before we get started uh, with the program, uh, let me ask Brother Dave first just to say hi to everybody. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Hope y'all had a great week this week. Hope you guys are going to have a good weekend ahead. I'm just uh, thankful to be alive, thankful to be here, and I uh, just want to say welcome to everybody in the chat tonight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Welcome to everybody. Uh, um, I'm kind of excited about this tonight because uh, uh, I have uh, some thoughts in mind, but uh, I don't want to jump ahead. Let's, let's first see. Is Paula here with us yet? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hi, Paula. Why don't you say hi, why don't you say hi to everybody and then, and then we'll be ready to get started, I guess. Hey, everybody. Uh, good to be here. Hi, Luke. And hi, Brother Dave. Hey, everybody in the chat. Um, yay, happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you remember that uh, TGIF, thank God it's Friday saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just th thank God it's today, every day, whether it's Friday or not. Every, every day is a Friday for me. <laughs> yep. Praise God. Okay. Um, all right, uh, let's look at the chat room first and see uh, see who's in there. And I'm trying to maneuver around uh, and learn to use the screen. Uh, uh, last week, um, if you were here with us last week, you know we had all kinds of technical issues. It's because I, I had the my internet service provider on my speed, but somehow things got messed up and it wasn't working right. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the reason for all those problems. Um, but uh, I'm expecting everything to go smoothly tonight. But what we're doing here on Friday nights now is uh, I'm trying to conduct the program without Matthias producing the program. And it's not that I don't want him to produce them. It's just that I want to be able to have a program. Uh, if he's not available, at least we can still continue it uh, and, and still do it, uh, even if he's uh, not available sometime. So I'm trying to learn how to do that and master it, and uh, that's what we're going to try to do tonight. And uh, Lord help us uh, that it goes smoothly. Uh, say hi to, to uh, we see, I see Switch is there. Hi, Switch. I wonder what Switch's name is and Sealed by the Blood. Uh, I wonder if Hendrix is really Hendrix or if this is a secret identity. Uh, Liam Kerwin, I'm, I'm guessing that's a real name. we got Brother Dave with us. Uh, John, J-O-N. I don't... I. I know that uh, one of the things that we do online uh, is um, we choose a username, and uh, many times it's not our actual name. Uh, I'm Luke Boozer, in case you didn't know my last name, Brother Luke, so I'm, I'm not uh, trying to conceal my actual identity, but uh, uh, some people are very concerned. They want to protect their identity. So, But if you, you know, the more you want to tell us, I'm assuming that Celine Frodima if I'm saying, pronouncing it Christ, uh, correctly, uh, Celine, uh, I hope I got it right. But I'm assuming that's your actual name. It's definitely Trexler. And, okay. Well, rather than go through the whole thing and try to acknowledge everybody, I think I got uh, all or most of you anyway. Welcome. I'm looking forward to the talk tonight. Now, you're probably aware, if you've been following us on Friday nights, that uh, we don't normally have an agenda um, it's basically whatever uh, subjects happen to come up, whatever's on your mind. If you have any blessings to share, any troubles to, you need help with, uh, any praise reports, uh, then, then that's what we want to do. However, um, well, let me first address that. Let me see if Sister Paula, uh, I, I have some things that uh, I, I want to bring to the table tonight, but I don't want to, uh, you know, um, 
impose that on everybody without first seeing what you want to really? talk about. Yes. Well, uh, real quick, real quick, two things. Uh, one, remember that whatever's on your OBS is what you're streaming. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why the three monitors is better than two. It's easier because you yeah. keep putting the chat up there. Yeah. Um, and then also look at your OBS in the bottom right. What color is that box? Uh, I don't have any color of my box. I just have a, a, a clock that says five minutes and 31 seconds. You don't have a little green box or yellow or red right next to it? Nope. That's okay, because uh, sh that should be giving you the strength of your stream. Oh, I, uh, right I have, now you're not buffering, but you were ha you were buffering pretty bad or like in the middle of what you were saying. So, mm -hmm. well, I have a mic auxiliary and and a uh, green line that runs across that moves, and I have right. desktop no, audio. Be, be, right now, it would be a very small little colored box in the very bottom right. No, of the screen, it's it's not there. Hey, maybe, Lisa. Maybe I have a different version of uh, of uh, the. Uh, um, I, right, that would I'll be asking you do. I'll have to look at it, but it, you seem to not be buffering now, so we're good. <laughs> All right, well, let me know in the chat room or anybody else if they, if you see we're having any technical problems. Let me know, Sister Lisa. It's nice to see you in the chat room. I I got your message that you would not be able to join us tonight, but but um, uh, you're in the chat room, so welcome. Okay, uh, let me start off with Sister Paula. Um, well, hold on, she's not just in the chat room; she's on the panel. Who is? Lisa? Sister Lisa. Oh, okay. I wasn't looking at that screen. So, oh, good. Lisa, you're here with us, too. Excellent. Uh, I wasn't expecting you. I'm glad that, I'm glad that you could make it. So, well, I guess let's, let's start off with you, Lisa. Um, say hi to everybody. And then also, if you have any subject, anything that you want to introduce uh, that for our, us to talk about tonight, uh, let me know. Hey, praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Uh, yeah, Brother Luke, I didn't anticipate that I would be able to uh, make it this evening. Um, the devil was really busy today, <laughs> but uh, I was able to get in here and, and uh, get connected, uh, I think, just in the nick of time. So um, just uh, wanted to be able to contribute if I could, be a blessing to uh all the saints of God this evening and also be blessed by them. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, praise Jesus. I'm, uh, I was real happy to see you here because I, when you sent me the text message that you were not going to be able to make it tonight, I was quite disappointed. Not that you're uh, under any kind of a burden or pressure to, to join us all the time, but obviously we always want you here whenever you can. Uh, do you have any uh, subjects or anything that uh, you want to bring up for discussion tonight? Yeah, you know, um, I was I was thinking, I was pondering and, and praying a little bit earlier at how, you know, I was, uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in one of the broadcasts, uh, something that Sister Paula V said that she appreciated about how sometimes we don't always hear the voice of God when we're praying and we're asking for an answer on something. And then, you know, you just have to kind of decide what's the best course of action and trust that he's going to bless you in your decision. And, you know, and often I say, I pray, Lord, if this ain't what you want me to do, because I can't hear you right now, then uh, then block me so I can't accomplish it. And I'll know that uh, this isn't what you want me to do. And I just recently had a situation that happened this week where uh, I had to just decide to act you know it wasn't any anything good or evil as far as you know as far as picking like saying you know people always wonder if you're talking about sin i don't know why people always think that no it's not about sin it's just about decisions in life that you need to make and you don't know whether you know you come to a fork in the road and you don't know whether to go left or right and you you don't we're alive all right so hopefully we're coming back up on Brother Luke's channel right now. We're having a few problems, technical issues, but I've got a strong stream. We should be, we should be good. It's still buffering. I see that, but I've got a strong. Like I'm looking at my stream. Strong. Um. 
There we are. We're on. You're good to go. Hi guys. Sorry, we switched uh, switched locations of streaming. So, Lord willing, we will be strong here on out. So, uh, all right. Where you guys nice. left off? Yeah. Where uh, where left off? Um, I don't know if Paul. Or do, you, Matthias, do I have to uh, join, or is it this? Oh, no, it's right here. We're in it. You're it's in it. Over automatically. Uh, you're already. In. It's yeah. back on. You're already in. I did that, and it ended up everything that he's. Uh, Luke. I. I don't am, see Brother Luke anymore. Am I part of it still? Yeah, okay. but it's not your. Okay. It's, it, I I hear you. Can you hear me? Your, yeah, it's just your icon though. I I closed right. off uh, OBS. Oh, my camera's turned off. Right. Let me yeah. leave and just come back and start from scratch. Or I'll be back in a minute. All right. <laughs> oh, sorry about all that, guys. Um, uh, Paula, do you remember where you were and what you were talking about, or do you just want to go somewhere else for now? No, I, I remember I, what she was talking I, yeah, about. Yeah, I remember what I was talking about. I don't know how much the chat well, I heard. Well, I, I stopped you maybe 10 seconds after it went off. They heard most of what you said. Oh, okay. Um, well, to recap, <laughs> what I was talking about was um, how uh, depressing it can kind of be when you minister to someone for such a long time and they seem like they're getting it after a while and then and then you realize they're not and they've gone back into lordship or, or something else um, and just how depressing that was. And when I was praying about it today, you know, the Lord reminded me of the verse that says, um, what shall it profit a man if he lose, if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And someone pointed out to me that that verse is actually saying that one soul is worth more than the whole world. And so that brought me a lot of comfort just knowing that, you know, all the work that we do preaching the gospel and talking to people and trying to point to Christ that a lot of it honestly is is going to be done in vain, unfortunately. But for the few that do hear and that we do help, I mean, praise God, because one soul is more important than everything in the world to God. So, and I was just curious how, how others dealt with that, um, you know, disappointment and when you see someone turning away from the truth after you've worked with them for such a long time. Well, Sister Paula, all I can say is that, you know, I recently had something that was very heartbreaking happen to myself and my family. And, you know, I am an active intercessor. I pray quite frequently. I don't say that to boast. I'm just sharing the situation. So when this incident happened it, it was it was um quite painful and shocking and i always think in in instances like this when tragedy happens and it's unexpected and you ask the lord why you know and you don't understand the reason and he may not give you an answer those are some of the toughest times you're seeking him and you don't get an answer and uh or at least not yet anyway and i always remember what peter said when jesus was speaking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood and he was speaking you know about the body and blood of christ and partaking of him but not not actually eating his literal flesh and drinking his literal blood but people misunderstood him and they said this is a hard saying who can hear it and they walked away it says many of his disciples walked no more in the way with him and so peter looked i mean uh, jesus looked at his disciples and he said will you two also go away and they said lord to whom shall we go and uh, jesus said i um, mean excuse me um peter said lord to whom shall we go or we know that you are that Christ. You're the one. You're the truth, Jesus. This is what he's saying to him. And, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but, <clears throat> excuse me. 
He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? And that's where I'm always at, is where, where am I going to go? Even though I might hit disappointment and not understand and don't get my answer right when I want it. Or, you know, I mean, God is the one that's sovereign. People have the misconception that, that they're sovereign in any way, shape or form. You know, there's an old joke about that. And it goes like this. If you want to make God laugh, show him your plans. So, you know, I know that he is sovereign and it is his hinge, his will and his timing and and things may not ever go the way that I want them to go and I still have to trust him because he's the one true and living God and there ain't nowhere else to go so I just have to sit down and pray and continue to trust and rely on him that no matter what even though it's difficult he is going to give me the strength to endure and to go through. And he promises he'll never allow what's more than we can bear. I like that, how you said that when, when you think of that verse, because I never thought about it that way. But really, I mean, where are we to go? There is no other way to go. Because the only absolute truth is the word of God. So even though what I was talking about, the depressing when you preach for such a long time to someone and they they're just not getting it um you know the frustration i felt earlier was just wanting to give up but really where else would i go because that is where truth is and um i guess just the longer that you do it i guess you get used to it you know oh yeah i mean I, it's very easy for us to get discouraged in this life but we have to remember that God is not a genie in a bottle and things may never go the way we want them to go. And and then what if it doesn't? <laughs> I mean, is that all you're here for is what you I don't mean you. I mean, people in general, uh, what we can get, what we what we want, what what our needs are. Is that the only reason or is it something more? Are you seeking the truth, which I always keep saying is Jesus? But I wanted to quote that passage because I kind of butchered that scripture a little bit. It's in the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, and it's right around verse, uh, let me start here at verse, I think, 63. It said, is the spirit that quickeneth, Jesus is speaking, the flesh profited nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, I say unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given him of my father. Well, I hope my computer doesn't crash. I'm sorry, y'all. The plug wasn't in, battery's dying, my apologies. And he said, therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Verse 67. Then, he, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So that's where I'm always at when, when I get those days that I just don't understand. And as you can see, they didn't understand. That's why they, they walked away. But then you have to make the decision because you didn't get your prayer answered right when you want to or because things didn't go the way you wanted to and all hell broke loose and things blew up in your face. Are you going to walk away? And if so, where are you going to go? To whom are you going to go? So I always just sit down and I go, Jesus, I don't understand. And I, I'm frustrated right now. But I'll tell you what, I know you're the only only place I can be. And I'm just going to hold on to your unchanging hand and trust you for the best outcome. And I'm relying on you, Jesus. And I'm still crying out to you, Jesus. And, and that's where I'm at. 
That was great when you quoted that. Um, I never realized how sad that sounded when you said, when Jesus said, um, will ye also go away? The way that you said it was, I'll bet he was kind of sad. And in fact, when I was praying about it this morning, um, I, I, I even said to him, I was like, if I'm this depressed over a couple of people, like how how much more sad is God when he sees all those who who just won't believe, you know? Oh, I see Luke is back. Are Hello, back? everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, for some reason, Brother Luke is back. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Well, uh, for some reason, my camera is not turned on, but uh, let me see if I can fix that real quick. Oh, settings, camera. Wow. Go ahead and carry on. I'll try to get my camera working. Well, Dave, do you have um, do you have some encouraging words when when you realize that maybe someone you've been working with for a long time uh, is kind of going the other way, the opposite direction, and you realize they're going away from the truth? Is there some verses or something that helps you to um, get back on the horse, so to speak? <laughs> Right. Like me personally, like if I'm beginning to stray or. Oh, no, what you mean? no, I was talking about, I mean, I know this has had to happen to you preaching the gospel for as well, long yeah, as no, I apologize. I just, I just thought we came back on just now. I oh, just, no, I'm sorry. About. No, we, we, what I was <laughs> talking about was, um, yeah, just, they were in the chat saying, uh, we've been back for like 10 minutes. I'm like, really? Oh, um, you know what? Maybe it needed to re be refreshed or something. I had to refresh. That's what I did. I had to leave yeah. out and come back in. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, what I was talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, was, um, you know, these couple of people that I've, you know, briefly talked to. I know other people in this group have talked to for a long, long time. And both of them I found out today are kind of going away from the truth. And you think of how much time and effort you spent with them and how oh, depressing gosh. it is <laughs> like that happens all the that? time yeah how do you uh how do you I, deal with that you know i i just really okay let me try to put it this way i understand what you're saying it happens all the time i mean you work with someone you pour into them you try to guide them you try to be there for them and they seem like they're coming closer and closer and they seem like they're right on the edge of, of, of understanding it and getting it and actually walking in it. And it just seems to fizzle out. You don't hear from them. And next thing you know, they're on a completely different direction. Oh, it happens so much. Sadly, it happens more than I would like it to. Um, but, you know, it, I learned a lot through all those situations. And, I and you know, now it, it's really crazy because a lot of people reach out. A lot of people you know, have questions or they want to know, and you just got to kind of discern like, okay, is this person for real seeking? Are they just curious? Are, you know, there's a lot of things we can do to just kind of balance it out and figure out, you know, what our move should be next. Um, you know, if somebody's really, really interested in, in, you know, trying to come to the truth of Jesus, then, you know, I will uh, invest the time and the effort into them. Um, but, you know, if they're just acting, a little off or if they're just kind of curious i just give them room to breathe and I, you know here's one thing that i've learned somebody who's really hungry for the truth or really seeking uh to be saved or to know about christ they're gonna hound you you know you you know they're gonna be around they're gonna be interested you're gonna see that uh tenacity within them to you know, even if they're getting it wrong, they want to know, like they're, they're, they're really dedicating themselves and you can kind of pick up on that. And, uh, for those type of people, you know, it's, it's really important that you, you know, give them your time, but I like to get people plugged into a local fellowship. I know some people don't agree with that all the way, but you know, just to start out until they get their feet wet, uh, I help them as much as I can, but I really, you know, encourage them to get plugged in, uh, you know, I usually ask them for their city or their zip code and I'll look up on the Internet and I'll, I'll rummage through the churches in their area. And I'll try to find two or three that I know, at least by their statement of faith, that are teaching, you know, the right gospel. Uh, usually I'll look for a, an independent Baptist church or a free grace church or, you know, non-denominational grace church and see what their statement of faith is and 
I try to get the individual to at least go visit the church, try to get, you know, around some fellowship under a pastor where they can at least have the word broken down and taught to them. Um, and if they're really, really interested, most of the time they do, they go. And then I hear, you know, stories later down the road that, you know, thanks for sticking out, sticking it out with me. You know, I found this great church. Me and my family are going to it. I'm learning so much. And now I'm, you know, and then as time goes on, they keep in touch with you. And the next thing you know, they're serving in church or they're getting, they're getting on, uh, on the evangelism team or they're doing, and now they know the word and it's, you just kind of like see God bring them in and get a hold of them and, and, and start working in them. And it's, it's good to see that, but it's rare. It's rare. I mean, a lot of people will come and, and be curious and, 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 you know, take up a lot of your time and, and effort just to pretty much just, you know, turn the other way and, and go their own way eventually. And sadly that happens, but I mean, what can we do? We can only plant and water and, and just pray that God brings increase, but yeah, it can be frustrating, especially somebody that you see seems to be coming right on the brink of, of understanding and, and coming and then poof, they just go the other way and you kind of wonder like what happened. Okay, hi. Um, I, everybody hear me and see me okay now? Yeah, I see you and hear you. Okay. Well, I obviously I missed uh, what you were talking about the last five or ten minutes while I was trying to get everything worked out, but I rebooted my modem and my restarted my computer and I got the camera working again, but so everything should be fine, uh, but I, I have no idea what uh, you've been talking about, so... Um, uh, there are some things I want to ask everybody about tonight, but I don't want to switch the subject if you're in the middle of something right now. So, well, no, I just had I was just wondering everybody's opinion. I can uh, restate it, and then you can give me. Yeah. Okay. Please do. Okay. I was just saying that um, that I I noticed a couple of people today that me and others have been talking to for a long time, and they seem to be coming around at times and today like two people i can think of i realized have gone the other way they're going away from the truth and just how depressed i was this morning to find this out and i was just curious about how everybody deals with that because it's um you know as matthias told me earlier uh you know remember the bible says who there be that find it mm -hmm. are we still alive yeah, I yeah. think yeah. so. <laughs> oh, okay. We're still, yeah, we're still going as far as I can tell. I see the chat room. Uh, yeah, we're uh, still going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I guess uh, if, if everybody's been discussing that, I'll give you my thoughts on it if you're interested. Uh, yes, please. Um, obviously, uh, we understand the greatness of the gift of of life everlasting. And that's why I, I always say that uh, if a person really understands it, um, what Jesus has accomplished, what we're promised and guaranteed this eternal life and a state of joy and bliss and happiness forever and ever, it's just, it's beyond our greatest imagination. Even Revelation says that no mind has imagined the good things that God has for those who love him. So um, uh, we understand the, the greatness of this salvation and, the, and this gift, and we want others to have it. We want uh, particularly uh, our loved ones to have it. And so we're, we're almost desperate to uh, share, share this with them and, and uh, hoping and praying and doing everything we can to uh, bring them into the faith. But we should all be aware that we, I'm sure we all do know this, and it's hard to accept though, is that we can't make anybody else believe. And all we can do is try to be ready with an answer and prepare ourselves as the best we can to uh, uh, and give them a reason for, the, for our faith. Uh, and so that's, that's what we're required to do, we're instructed to do, and that's all we're able to do. Um, so I, I've compared um, this ministry as a Christian to kind of being in a, a, a medical doctor. Um, uh, what we, what we, the type of medicine we're practicing when we are um, evangelists 
is uh, like the doctor that specializes in uh, the, the birth. Uh, what kind of doc, what do they call that doctor? A, uh, that, that helps a mother give birth. Uh, Obstetrician. Yes. Okay. So we're kind of obstetricians. What, what we really want to do is um, uh, help bring this new life in, into the world. And, uh, um, but um, also we, we, we should realize that um, uh, we're going to fail more times than not because, you know, the, Jesus said that uh, there's only few that find it. Now, I don't know what the, per I've tried to figure out this percentage many times over the years and the, myself and others that we've, we've tried to do the math and estimate. And we, we've pretty much agreed that well, probably only about 3% of the population of humanity uh, will believe uh, the gospel as we understand it from the Bible. So it's a, it's a tiny little fraction of people. So more times than not, we're going to end up disappointed and, and end up feeling like a failure that we were not able to uh, lead our friends and families into the faith. Uh, so there's another kind of doctor besides an obstetrician, and this is a, an emergency room doctor, or a, let's say a, 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 if you're dealing with a terminal illness, let's say you specialize in cancer and you know that many of your patients are going to die, or you're an emergency room and you know that many people come in there and that they're in a, such a situation that you're trying to save them, but you're going to fail. So these doctors, uh, they're instructed, part of their training is to develop an attitude of um, uh, distancing yourself uh, from it, because if you get too close, it is too hard psychologically to continue to deal with all the loss. So you have to, um, uh, there's a particular word, I'll think of it in, in a minute, but um, so all I'm saying, Paula, is that, you know, I know you want your friends and family especially to come into the faith and it's discouraging if they don't, but we just have to prepare ourselves that we're going to fail more times than not. Most people are not going to believe and receive this gift and uh, we need to know that going in. It's kind of like an attitude of a professional salesperson. I've, I spent a lot of time in the sales profession and uh, I've sold a lot of different things. And usually when you're selling, uh, you're going to have a, a high uh, refusal rate. Even if you're one of the best salesmen, maybe you'll sell one out of 10 or one out of three or you know, of, your, of your prospects. And uh, so in, in this, there's a, there was a book called by Og Mandino, the greatest salesman in the world. It's a little paperback bestseller. Uh, Og Mandino wrote it, and it really turns out it's about the Apostle Paul. And uh, uh, but that it, one of the things that you learn in that book is that uh, um, you have to develop this attitude, knowing that uh, you're going to. Uh, have a lot of uh, disappointments and, and failures, and you have to be able to keep positive. And no, don't take it personally, because we it's not our responsibility to make someone else believe. But I will say the encouraging part of this, and I may be sound pessimistic when I'm telling every, everybody, but the encouraging part of it is that maybe your friends and family we don't believe today, or maybe they won't believe next year. But that doesn't mean five or 10 or 20 years from now, they won't come in, come to the faith. I've seen that happen many times in my life where I had people that they let me know right away, oh, don't, let's not talk about Jesus and the Bible. You know, I don't want to really talk, I'd rather talk about something else. And so we have to respect that. If they don't want to hear about it, okay, maybe next year they'll want to hear about it. And I've had people contact me and say, uh, I know that you've been, into the Bible or you're, uh, you're doing some kind of Christian work or something uh, all these years. And I, I've been paying attention, but I, I, I've got some questions for you. But five years ago, they didn't want to hear about it. So I think that's the kind of attitude we have to have if we're going to keep our, our uh, any kind of mental health. Well, that's very encouraging. Um, and I, I don't think of them as a lost cause either because I had to hear the gospel more than once before I was actually ready to receive it and look into it, see if these things are so. So, I, I mean, there's hope for anybody. So it's encouraging to know that you've had people 
come back a few years later. Yeah. And Matthias has talked about how he uh, pushed too hard initially after he got saved and he started telling his friends and family. And, and what if you try too hard, uh, they end up um, re resenting it and and uh, you're not, you end up not drawing them to Christ, but but pushing them away. Uh, so uh, we just have to know that uh, in, in, in the right, there's a right time for everybody. I know the Bible says today is the day of salvation, but maybe that's talking about today is the day, but it's really 10 years from now, that's the day. <laughs> um, all right, uh, does uh, anybody want to say anything more about that uh, subject? All right, well, let me let me introduce some what I've been thinking about and what I was hoping to talk about tonight. Um, you know, probably about 500 or 600 of, of my 1100 videos are these group talks like this. But the other 500 videos are videos that I've made just talking to the camera and trying to teach on a subject. And um, I usually take a little time to, uh, you know, I, I wait for the idea to come to me. I'm not trying to think of ideas, but when, when the, uh, like today um, or yesterday, as I'm doing this daily walking now and, and finding this is a great prayer time as I go for my walks, a lot of thoughts are coming to my mind. And so sometimes an idea comes to my mind and usually I try not to push it and say, okay, I got to make a video right now. I, I, I kind of want to let it simmer for a while and then maybe I'll make a note here or there. And after a few days, I have a few notes and bullet points that I want to discuss. And that's what I did uh, for the subject I want to talk about tonight. But I actually made a video. I was going to make a video of my own without bringing it to the, the group tonight. And I, and I actually made recorded the video three different times. And each time I just removed it and didn't upload it because I just never felt good about it never felt like i really did it justice and i thought well i'm eager to talk about it so why not ask the panel tonight and get your thoughts on the, this subject and uh rather than really turning into a subject i'll just show you the verses that are that come to my mind and get your your thoughts on these verses here um the first verse is um genesis 1 26 and god said let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And I'm, I'm trying to emphasize the plurality as I say this verse. It says, it says, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So let me, let me get everybody's thoughts on that. Whoever's eager to talk about it, go ahead and first. I will, I guess. Yeah. Um, I've always taken this to just be uh, a picture of the Trinity. Us is plural. And if the Godhead is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then that would make sense. And that's not the only time he's said us. He said that with the Tower of Babel. He said, let us go down and confound their language. And... This kind of falls in line with the idea of, uh, you know, in the New Testament, Paul prayed that your whole body, your whole soul, and your whole spirit be preserved blameless unto the coming of the day of the Lord. Um, and I think the that's the three parts of man, body, soul, and spirit. And the spirit is not quickened yet before you're saved. So you're really just body and soul. You do have a spirit. It's like a pilot light is how I think about it. And once you get saved, it's like the pilot light whew, lights the whole thing. Once you're saved, it's a huge bright light. But before that, it's not completely dead because that's how God speaks to us. And that's how he draws us is through the spirit. And since you brought this up, I wanted to mention this. I was teaching my daughter last year about fractions and we were uh, learning how to convert a fraction into a decimal and I was showing her the fraction two thirds and I was like see if you change this into a decimal it's 0. 0.666 <laughs> and then all of a sudden I was like wait that's the number of a man 
that's also the number of beasts, but Revelation says that's the number of man. And I thought about it. I was like, you know, man is two thirds, their body and soul. A natural man is a two thirds. That's why they're 666. You need that spirit to be quickened. You need that last third. That way you get three over three, which is just one. It's whole. So I just thought that was really interesting that two thirds, if we are three parts, body, soul, and spirit, mm -hmm. and we're made in God's image, and he's three parts, that before we're saved, we're actually just the number of a man, 666, or two thirds of a person. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that out there? Is that, do you guys see what well, I'm saying? Let me, let me, I'm eager to shout out amen. And I, uh, I'm happy where you went with it. Uh, you actually took a couple of minutes to kind of summarize or, or kind of give a, a, a an outline of the entire talk uh, that I wanted to have tonight. You brought up a lot of points that are part of this. That exactly, you knew exactly where I wanted to go. But I loved your your point, and I haven't heard it stated that way before. But uh, you know, I certainly agree that uh, we're born only two thirds of a person because uh, we don't have a living spirit. And that means if if you do the math, as you said, that's uh, 666. So you're right. It's just really uh, uh, interesting how you came up with that. And I've never heard it before. So um, well, Lisa or, or Dave, uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that verse and what Paula said? I was going to say the same thing as Paula. Uh, that verse literally reminds me, uh, you know, of the triune nature of God. Let's make man in our image. You know, and it's, it's pretty much what she uh, said. I was gonna, I was gonna follow along those lines. So I, I think she said it and summed it up really good. Yeah, uh, really stated it beautifully. And as I said, I, anytime I hear a, a unique uh, uh, co concept and exp expressing what I believe, but in a in a unique way that's profound, I always really appreciate that. Uh, Sister Lisa, have you, you you came back? Did you hear what we're talking about? Do you have thoughts on it? No, Brother Luke. I think I heard the last <laughs> three or four words that Dave was saying. I did not get to hear. Okay. So well, I could not speak intelligently about that. All right. Well, I'm asking people to, to uh, explain and respond to me about this verse, Genesis 126, particularly the plurality of these words. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and sister paula went first and she did a beautiful explanation of of the triunity of the, the godhead and the plurality and and uh and she uh she talked about the being born with a uh, we're two-thirds of a person when we're born uh we have, we're a living soul and living functioning body but dead spiritually so we're only two-thirds and two-thirds in a decimal system is 0.666. So that was a very interesting thought. But what do you have to say about that verse in this, this subject? Well, um, just that it is definitely in harmony with the rest of the scriptures concerning the Godhead. I mean, uh, I think it's in 1 John where it says these three bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So whenever I would ever see that, it just reminds me of the eternal Godhead and how, I mean, for example, uh, where you said, where it says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. If you look at Genesis 1, 1 right there, it says in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And then it says, and the spirit is capital S there of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then God said, well, Jesus is revealed as the word. In fact, that's not only his name revealed in the gospel of John, the first chapter, but also in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, it says um, he was given a name that no man knew, which is the word. So we see the word speak right there. So you see God, the father, God, the Holy spirit and God, the son, the word right there in Genesis one, one. So, uh, whenever I see that, it just, you know, it just always reminds me that mm -hmm. scripture uh, is in harmony with itself and the Bible defines itself and, you know. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, yeah, the um, uh, Genesis 1-1 one, one, uh, is uh, also, we can use the word, um, it says, 
in the beginning God, well, the form of the word God is Elohim and it's plural. So uh, the very first time the word God appears in the Bible, in the very first verse, we can see that there's a plurality. And this is not a new idea that we just discovered in the, as Christians, but uh, it was commonly understood by the, the Jewish theologians that even though we have one God, somehow there's a, uh, they use it, the plural to express it. So there was at least some kind of a hint uh, of this, whether they understood it, they didn't understand it as, they certainly didn't, did not understand it as, understand it as we do today, but they, they knew that there's something to this, and that's why they express it in plural. Uh, now, I said that I, uh, I've been thinking about this subject, and I organized my thoughts and, and listed some verses, and Sister Lee, when I asked Paula to respond to Genesis 126, she said exactly what I was thinking and expounded on it even further to, to that's where we want to go with this conversation. And then when I asked Lisa to respond to, to it, she immediately went to 1 John 5, uh, 7, and that happens to be the next verse on the list that I wanted to ask everybody about. Um, it's not it's not just luck that we happen to you know cite these verses and go exactly the same direction. That it's it's because we understand the scriptures, we understand this Godhead and uh, the, the, what these verses mean. So it's it's only natural that uh, you say, okay, if God's Genesis one twenty six says um, God is plural, let us make man in our image. The verse that comes to Lisa's mind is, well, what about 1 John 5, 7? There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, I know that um, other translations will either um, re re remove that verse, it, it's not part of their, uh, their translation, or they put a footnote challenging it so that it was they believe that maybe it was inserted by a scribe, but I don't know of any verse, single verse in the Bible that kind of expresses the, the triunity of the Godhead better than this one verse. So I, I treasure this verse. So let me ask Dave to go first. Uh, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. I know that we're all uh, Trinitarian in our uh, theology. Brother Dave, what do you say? Yeah, and that's it. And that's a, you know, that's a key, that's a really key verse. Um, and, and even if, you know, there's a lot of speculation and argument about that verse being added later. Uh, and even if that's the case, I mean, if, once you really dig into scripture, uh, you can see that you can see the triune God in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of examples. Uh, Jesus tells us, you know, in, in John 17, uh, he's saying that he was with his father. And so, um, you know, there's a, I don't, well, I don't know if people in the chat are aware of it, but there is a, uh, a heavy push to deny the triune nature of God. And uh, I believe it's called oneness modalism or modalism uh, where, you know, they deny the um, different, uh, you know, persons of God. And, and when I say persons, I don't mean three gods. Trinitarians don't believe that there's three gods, but we absolutely recognize that uh, there are, um, you know, God the Father is, is, you know, of all, greater than all. Jesus said, my Father is even, is greater than all. And so Jesus as the Son is still God, yet he's the Son and the Holy Spirit, if you see that they, you know, Jesus did his Father's will, uh, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. And and you can look at Matthew 3 when Jesus was being baptized, and we literally see a, a, a depiction of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, you know, all in the same picture. Um, yet it, it's really hard to deny the triune nature of God. I, I don't understand how people do it, but... Uh, I definitely believe that uh, if you if you dig in the scriptures, you will not come away with uh, uh, modalism. You will definitely understand that there is, a, I don't want to say subordination, but willful subordination, like the Son obeys the Father, the Holy Spirit obeys the Son and the Father. You know what I mean? Yet they're all God. 
And it's, you know, it's, it, it is something that's puzzling that, that our human brain may never, ever be able to figure out fully. But I think as you dig through scriptures, you will see that God is definitely uh, triune in nature. All right. Well, I, I really don't know anybody in our congregation that is a modalist. Now, I personally, my view on it is that if someone is a modalist, uh, I would not shun them. Um, uh, I, I would, because even modalism uh, does agree with the, the doctrine of that Jesus is the eternal God Almighty. Um, the, the objection I would have is that if someone says Jesus is not eternal, that he came into existence, he had a beginning. Uh, he, that would make him a creature rather than the creator of all things. And uh, so modalism does not violate the, uh, the, uh, the, the deity of Christ. It's just that they believe that um, uh, the Godhead, uh, it, it, there's one God, and it's Jesus Christ. That's why they, they go by the term oneness uh, or, or Jesus only. Jesus is the one God, but sometimes he operates at, in the mode of the Father, and sometimes he operates in the mode of the Holy Spirit, and sometimes he operates in the mode of Jesus or the Son. So it's like putting on a different hat or a different mask, or uh, but it's it's one. Uh, and obviously, we don't agree with that. We you know, I, there's all kinds of reasons not to. Uh, it's more complex to try to explain that there's actually three distinct persons in the Godhead, and yet you're still having only one God. And how do you explain that? Well. As much as I object to the uh, the church fathers in the second, third, fourth centuries, uh, um, I've studied it quite a bit, um, and uh, I've studied uh, the, what they did do uh, that I appreciate is they had ecumenical councils where every thirty years or fifty or hundred years, and you know, after a period of time, the leaders from the known world would come together in one place and get together and discuss. And, and uh, try to uh, work out some theological questions. And then they would write a uh, decree uh, called canon uh, or, or write a creed to express their conclusions. And, we, and I have a play that's titled Early Church Creeds, and I analyze line by line the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Revised Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and one other, I forgot. But uh, uh, these creeds, uh, I, I will have to give them credit, each creed built on the one before, and by the time they got in the end, uh, they did a masterful job of, of, uh, of explaining this Godhead in, in human words. And it, you know, a lot of times people just throw up their hands and say, well, we can't really explain it, we can't understand it, it's a mystery, the, the triune Godhead. But I think the church fathers did a good job in those creeds of, of kind of defining it. Uh, they really messed up uh, in their transition away from free grace salvation to uh, faith plus works in the early centuries. Uh, so that's where they failed. But at least on the Godhead, they did some good work that I, I recommend everybody study those creeds. Um, so uh, that's uh, modalism and Trinitarianism. Uh, but the next verse, the reason I, I, I asked about, uh, okay, let us make man in our image to show that God is plural, singular and yet plural. And then 1 John 5 said, okay, if, if, we're made, if man is made in God's image, what is the image of God? Well, God is one, but three. And, and if you look at me, you can see I'm one person but I'm three. I'm Luke bodily, I'm Luke mentally, and I'm Luke spiritually, body, soul, and spirit, uh, and yet still one Luke. So in that way, uh, it says that's how we're made in God's image, that triune, and yet one. Um, so now the next verse, uh, unless, does anyone want to say more on that because, before I go I to do. the next verse? Yeah, go ahead. I do. Uh, there's also another way of looking at it, Brother Luke, <clears throat> and that is that uh, we know that God reveals himself in three distinct persons as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we are made in his image in this regard as well. When we could be in the room, take, for example, myself as a woman, I can be married and have a husband. 
I can be a mother and have children. And I am also a daughter of my parents. And all of these people can be in the same room. And yet they experience me with different relationships, but I'm the same person. To my parents, I'm their daughter. To my husband, I'm his wife. To my children, I'm their mother. Yet I'm the same person. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that uh, historically people have, have tried to explain or give examples, pictures of this triune Godhead. Uh, a lot of times people use water, uh, H2O. You know, you got one molecule of water and it's two hydrogen, one oxygen, but it's one it's water, uh, or uh, you can say water is um, uh, solid, liquid, or gas. Uh, uh, but the problem with that, people think that that's a, a picture of the Trinity. <laughs> Don't use that as, a, as an example of the Trinity. That's actually uh, an illustration of modalism in that you have water just simply changing to a different mode. It can change to gas, it can change to liquid, and it can change to solid. So um, there, it's interesting how all we different ways we attempt to try to, uh, you know, uh, picture this Godhead. Uh, Brother any Luke, more? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just real quick, one more scripture that ought to mess everybody up <laughs> is uh, Colossians 2, verse 9. And it's speaking about Jesus. It says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, I was looking at my playlist the, just the other day on uh, the deity of Christ proven. I probably have about 30 videos in there that are by various people, uh, you know, proven the deity of Christ. And uh, of course that's, that's one of the verses, one of the main verses we always want to have on our list of, of uh, you know, deity of Christ verses. Uh, all right, the next thing, let, let's go to Genesis 2-7. Uh, we've established that uh, God wanted to make us in God's image, and God's image is triune, so we're one person in body, soul, and spirit. And then now Genesis 2-7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Okay, um, now uh, maybe you can imagine why I'm going there next. What, what, what would you explain was the significance of what happened at that, in, in that case? Uh, uh, Brother Dave, why don't you go first? Or not, how about Lisa or Paula? Um, I, I'll go. What? Okay, go ahead. What are you go ahead. About the verse? Gen yeah, Genesis two seven. Yeah. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Uh, we could go ahead and expound on that verse, and what do you think is significant that we need to learn from that? Um. Well, that maybe. All the elements in the earth are found in man. And um, this verse, see, I've heard the um, pro-abortionists use this verse to, to prove that babies aren't living souls until they breathe. And um, that's when you brought up this verse, that's the first thing I thought about. And I don't think that that's what that means necessarily um i believe that that was how it was for adam um that god breathed the breath of life because all life comes from god he is life anything that's living it's sort of borrowing from god because if it's energy all that energy is going to go back to the source but i think in particular since it was the first man um, that that is when he became a living soul was when he got the breath of life. I think mm -hmm. all subsequent people 
Um, it's way before that, that they become a living soul, way before they actually breathe. Um, well, if I can interject something here. Mm -hmm. One thing that's fascinating, if you think about it, ever since God breathed into Adam the male, the breath of life, everyone else's breath has continued from him and the woman. There was, for example, God did the first suscitation. <laughs> now man can only do resuscitation. But everyone who is born has got that breath of life going all the way back to the first time God breathed life into man. You know, what you said about the abortion saying, well, see, babies don't draw breath. That's absolutely false. If you study how, and I'm not saying your falsest problem, I'm talking about their argument. Um, because the umbilical cord goes right to the mother. And as the mother is breathing, the baby is breathing. Exactly. It, yes, thank you. <laughs> Yes, so that breath of life from that mother, if we were to trace that all the way back, mother and father, mother and father, it goes all the way back to the first time God breathed life into man. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Uh, that's not where I wanted to go with the verse, but that's uh, certainly fine. I, I know that I've heard other people, uh, there's a, uh, some Christians that I know, uh, one, uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman, and another one, Brain Audi. She's no longer on YouTube, as far as I know. But I respect uh, them both, their intellects. But uh, they both came to the conclusion that uh, this verse showing that uh, abortion is okay because until they take a breath, they're not a living soul. And so you're right, uh, Sister Paula. It's unfortunate that people use that verse to, ju to justify it. I have something else in mind, though, but, but let me get Brother Dave's uh, thoughts on that verse and then tell you why I, put, I have that verse on this list. Hey, Brother Luke. Well, I mean, what I get from that verse simply, I take something completely different away from that verse, and it shows that uh, you know how Jesus Christ is uh, from everlasting to everlasting. He was not a created being. He's always existed. And same with, uh, you know, the Father and the Holy Spirit. And, and I just take from that that we aren't, uh, we are created beings. And, you know, even though when we get born again, we have the divine uh, nature of God or the divine Holy Spirit of God living in us, we are we in and ourselves of our flesh are not divine and we're just uh, created because and the reason I, I take that from the verse is because there are people out there who believe that we can reach divinity or that we can uh, uh, walk as perfectly and sinless as Jesus walked and, and I just don't uh, foresee that being possible being that we were created uh, and 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 not divine from everlasting. Does that? I mean, if that makes any sense, that's what I take from it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the 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 what I have in the back of my mind as far as the points I want to try to make to everybody tonight in this uh, these verses I've selected uh, is. Uh, remember when uh, Jesus breathed into the apostles? Uh, and this was before Pentecost, of course, and uh, this was not a uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, a sealing of the Holy Spirit. Was that in John, Brother Luke? Was that in the book of John? Probably, yeah. Uh, imagine it is. Yeah, when he uh, breathed in, yep, to the disciples, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know that uh, when when we believed, uh, the Holy Spirit came into us and uh, brought our spirit to life and stayed in us, but uh, permanently. But when Jesus breathed into the apostles, uh, it was uh, he was filling them with the Holy Spirit. And at and, and that time, the purpose of it was to empower them to perform miracles. So he, sent, he sent them off on a mission to do miracles. And uh, um, so by Jesus breathing into them the, the Holy Spirit, this is what I think of on this verse here is that with Adam and Eve, when God breathed into their nostrils, he breathed the Holy Spirit into Adam and Eve. And this is when that one third was, uh, became uh, 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 three thirds, uh, two thirds became three thirds, Sister Paula. 
See, he, he, they would have a soul and a, and a body, but until God gave them the Holy Spirit, they didn't have a living spirit. So Adam and Eve did receive a living spirit and they're complete. They're complete humans, three thirds of a person right, right then. Um, so um, I look at it like this, uh, if you can, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, I'm not gonna show up on the screen, but let's say that this hand of mine, it, it represents a man's spirit. And, and, and then this is the spirit of God and God's spirit joins man's spirit and man's spirit is quickened and becomes alive, united or connected to the Holy Spirit of God, one spirit. And uh, I think that's what happened here. This was the quickening or the bringing of, of Adam and Eve's spirit to life. Um, I like to give me any feedback on that if you if you think that I'm justified in, in uh, explaining it that way. No, I think that's right on. All right. Okay. Uh, unless anybody wants to say more about that, I'll go to the next verse. Um, and the, this is Genesis chapter two, verse sixteen and seventeen. It says. And the Lord commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now there are two facts here that are essential we understand. One is God decrees that if they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they will die. And then he even says, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I understand that last part of verse 17 to be that the very day you eat it, you're going to die. Uh, and yet we know that they live seven or 800 years. So can anybody speculate to me, what do you think happened on that day that they ate of the tree? Um, they that died. they died spiritually. Mm -hmm. They were cut off from God. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that's all I know of is that the minute they ate of it, they were they were cut off spiritually, died spiritually. Mm -hmm. We yeah. Brother Luke, I wanted to say real quick, just real quick, uh, in Jeremiah one five, just to speak to what you said about those two people who were saying that until a baby breathes in life that it's it's not human mm -hmm. jeremiah the prophet the lord says he said before i formed thee in the <clears throat> in the belly i knew thee and before thou camest forth out of the womb i sanctified thee and i ordained thee a prophet unto the nations life does not begin it might never to be humble opinion and conception it begins when god sees you and since no one but god can say that no one has uh the right or the authority to end a life. But anyway, that's my never be home opinion. Now getting back to this scripture, um, cause that was really bothering me that, that statement that uh, they made, but, um, getting back to this scripture. Yes, it's absolutely a uh, spiritual death. Um, uh, I believe Paul addresses this in, well, I shouldn't say Paul in the book of Hebrews, it is addressed that when Jesus came, he came to deal with putting first things first, which was to go back and uh, by his resurrection, offer regeneration to man. He's the resurrection and the life. When we get born again, we're all still, if the Lord tarries, we have an appointment with death physically, but we've been born again spiritually. And so what Jesus came to do was place first things first, which was restore man spiritually and then when he comes again and he comes back down here and he sets things in order, he's going to restore man physically. But uh, a lot of people don't want to wait. Uh, we don't want to wait for you, Jesus. We want to try to do it now and receive eternal life now. And then we don't have to serve you. We can do our own thing and all this so crazy stuff. But he came to put first things first, which was to restore man to his spiritual state, which is right fellowship with God and uh, eternal life. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, uh, the, the previous verse, I wanted to make the point that 
uh, God breathes the whole the spirit into them. Now they're a complete body, soul, and spirit being. And, and then in this verse here, uh, he says that the day that they eat is to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they will die that day. And yet they lived seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years. I don't remember exactly, uh, but they lived uh, bodily for hundreds of years. So the question we have to ask is, was God wrong or, or, or what exactly happened? Because um, he said they would die that very day. And uh, my, I'm saying that the same way God spirit went into Adam and Eve in the beginning, on the day that they fell, God's spirit was withdrawn. So here you have the spirit of God and man's spirit connected, united, and then the fall, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what do we call death oftentimes? People say death is separation from God. So spiritually, the spirit of God withdrew. There's separation. And now man is left with a stub, a dead spirit, a non-functioning spirit. Still a mind, a soul, and a body that works, but this, uh, dead spiritually. Um, so give me your, your feedback on that if anybody yeah, thinks I'm right. Can, right I, or wrong or... can I add in on this one? Sure. Um, with, uh, with what you're saying, I agree 100%. But I actually think that there's a something called spiritual literal. Just because it happens spiritually and we can't see it because of the veil, it's still literal. And so I, what you're talking about, also, it, when that stub is there, they're dead. They're, they're truly uh, the walking dead. Um, and they need to be quickened to be made alive. But, and that's the void that everybody has in their heart, their spirit, that they're trying to find you know, comfort and uh, trying to fill that void but it's only God shaped only God can fill it because what you're saying when he stepped, stepped out, but think about the light and the, the light that, uh, lighteth every man that cometh into this world. Jesus is that light. And what Paulo was saying earlier about the pilot light, that's that dead stub. And that's also the conscience. That's also how God is drawing all men unto himself because through conscience and creation, those are their witnesses. And so I actually think that when we get born again, that pilot light uh, uh, gets ignited and it is now a bright light. And that bright light is the light of the Holy Spirit. Now, we can't see it in this realm. Some people might say, oh, I feel your aura, or I can feel uh, the love of God coming off. But, but what they're actually feeling in a physical sense is the spiritual light that's shining on them. That same spiritual light is the light that dissolves the spiritual wickedness, the darkness that flees in Jesus' name because of it. Now, what if that light was inside Adam and Eve? And that's why they couldn't even look down and know that they were naked because the light, they couldn't even be aware of it. But when God left and that light, like when, when spiritual and physical truly did have that divide and that was when they ate from the fruit and God separated in such a way, uh, that's when they, the light uh, went underneath the veil and they didn't have it, and they could tell that they were naked and wanting to get to sow fig leaves. Uh, and even before this happened, that's why they couldn't see. So I don't know if that's the case, but I've pondered on it a lot, and it makes a lot of sense, especially with the examples we see in Scripture. All right. Thank, thank you for your thoughts on that, brother. Uh, um, I'd like to respond to uh, Yvonne. Um, he says, I don't spiritualize that verse. Um, I think it applies to their physical bodies that will eventually die, that they lose their immortality. Um, well, Yvonne, um, 
the point I'm trying to, to make everybody understand is to get to the conclusion I want to come to tonight is that this verse says that for in the day that they eat us thereof, thou shalt surely die. I believe that it's inescapable that God is saying they're going to die that very day. And if scriptures are telling us that they lived hundreds of years beyond that point, then we either have a discrepancy, a contradiction, or an error in the Bible, or there's got to be some other way of understanding this. And, and so, yes, uh, the Bible also says that uh, the sentence of death came to all men. So on that very day, men moved from immortality to mortality. Uh, we're all born as mortals now without immortal life. Uh, and we get immortality when we put our faith in Jesus, uh, but uh, uh, they uh, they were mortal. There was a death sentence so that they were in the process of dying. From the day you're born, you're growing, but then you're eventually working your way towards that end, that death. But so what was the death that happened on that very day? That was a spiritual death, and, and the reason... Uh, I want to go to this next verse to make that point. Let's look at Ephesians 2, verse 1, 2, and 3. And it says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Um, so the most of these, uh, these three verses here is talking about the nature of humanity. It says, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. So all people, us and all others, are children of wrath. And there's a description of who we are, children of disobedience. Uh, uh, our conversations in times past for the, the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So um, this is telling us that um, uh, this is our identity. We are... Uh, uh, not alive spiritually, if we look at the verse two, two verse one, it says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So it's telling us that before we're born again, we're actually walking around dead in a sense. Now, yeah. Okay, I'll let you go, brother. Uh, brother, obviously, uh, when you're born, you're able to uh, walk and talk and think and reason and decide and all these things you're able to do. So you have a functioning mind, you have a functioning body. So what is dead, brother? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think we partake in the same uh, thing that Adam and Eve did. Uh, the moment we sin, uh, I think we spiritually die. The Bible, like you said, the uh, you know, we're alienated from God. We're dead in trespasses. We're um, strangers, the Bible says, or we are, uh, you know, and that's that's the whole point of, of Jesus uh, having to reconcile us back unto God. Where, as you said in Ephesians 2 says, we've been quickened by the spirit of God. Uh, that's the reconciliation that we uh, have to have because the moment that we all sin, uh, we spiritually die as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I need to uh, make uh, clarify something uh, that I think is um, important to be uh, understood is that the, um, this verse says that um, we, and, and we're by nature, the children of wrath. So if, if we're that by our nature, that means that even before we're uh, old enough to understand right and wrong and willfully disobey and sin and begin sinning, that we are children of wrath naturally. It's our nature. That is the point. Um, uh, 
and, and so responding to these three verses here, I, let me put it this way and ask get, get everybody's thoughts. Did anybody teach you how to lie when you were a little child, two, three, four years old? Did anybody teach you how to, you know, be deceptive, you know, or any type of sin? Maybe later on when you got older, older people started coming up with devious, devious things to teach you how to, you know, really be more complicated type of sinners. But just children don't have to be taught how to sin. We don't have to be taught how to lie. The most natural thing there is for us is to lie or to sin. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking that in Ephesians 2, 1, 2, and 3, this is telling us that as a result of Adam and Eve, when uh, this uh, uh, this previous verse, we're talking about how uh, uh, what happened at the fall, there was a death, there was a spiritual death. And then as Sister Paula said in the very beginning, all of us are born as two thirds of a people because we're all dead. We're all born with a, a living functioning body, a living functioning soul slash mind. And yet, we don't have this living functioning spirit because the spirit of God is uh, not passed down to us. Uh, we did not inherit it because it was lost at the fall. So we're all born two thirds of a person at 0 0.666 that she, she mentioned. That's our nature. Uh, so let me get your anybody's feedback on. I, I'm trying to systematically show you what happened in our condition, and, and uh, use the verses to to show you why I'm coming to these conclusions. I don't know if this TV show is still popular, but uh, you know when the Walking Dead, this zombie show was real uh, on everyone's Facebook wall, and my ministry was on Facebook. Uh, I came up with a saying that um, to reference how many people were talking about that. But after I typed it out, I was like, wow, okay, thank you, God. But those who have the breath of life without the spirit of God are truly the walking dead. So mm -hmm. the breath of life is the gift that God gives them of this time on, on this earth, that it's through his power, his energy, and the spirit of God is what they need to be saved. And if they do not have it, they literally are the zombies, the walking dead that they go, mm -hmm. Hollywood tries to picture so much. Yeah. Did you know that I have a video titled, uh, There Really Are Zombies Among Us? No, I didn't, but I, yeah. that made you. Yeah. That's right, the exactly. point. Yeah, that's the exact point I was making in that. So uh, let me get everybody else's feedback, uh, Paula or Dave or, or, or uh, Lisa. Um, I'm, I'm trying to build to this, to make this point uh, that um, we made in the image of God, we're triune, and yet the spirit of God that was in Adam and Eve withdrew, and uh, all of us who are descendants are born two-thirds of a person without a living spirit. We're... we're uh, dead in trespasses and sins, and that's why we have the need for this new birth. Is what we're getting to. Uh, so, uh, Lisa or Paula or, or Dave, what do you what do you say about that? Um, I'll just say that uh, that's true. I, I didn't believe sin actually existed before I had a, a child. <laughs> um, I was really ignorant. I was an atheist, but as I raised my child, I realized what you just said earlier. I didn't teach her to lie. I didn't teach her to bop kids on the head and steal their toys. I didn't teach her to talk back to me and disobey. Uh, that was just already in there. Um, and she eventually led me to God. It was kind of a miracle, a little gift from God. Um, but I did want to say uh, about the Garden of Eden earlier when we were mm -hmm. talking about that. Um, yeah. It's interesting that out of all the trees, only two are mentioned, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And one brought death and one brought life and they chose death and they didn't already, they were not already immortal because God said, we got to get them out of here lest they eat from the tree of life and gain eternal life because that way they would be in a sin state forever. So it was actually a blessing that God 
um, kicked them out. So I thought about this one day. I was like, well, what if they had chosen the tree of life? What if they, because they were free to eat of that tree and all the other trees. What if they had chosen the tree of life? Would God have get, gotten rid of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And I think he would have because they chose the wrong. They chose death. So he took them away from the eternal life. If they had chosen life, in my opinion, I think he would have taken away the possibility of death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, I'm not the original person to express it this way, but uh, the, um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents law, uh, right and wrong. Uh, understanding, you know, the, the knowledge of good and evil are right and wrong. And the tree of life represents Jesus uh, on the tree, uh, life everlasting. Um, okay, uh, Lisa or, or uh, uh, Dave, uh, that last verse. Yeah, I wanted to share um, what you were talking about earlier about uh, babies. Nobody has to teach them to lie. I was speaking to a very nice lady, a, a co-worker who kind of grew up, I think, a more akin to Sister Paula. She wasn't like antagonistic towards God, but she just really didn't know anything about God. She wasn't raised to know anything about God. And so I was talking to her one day. I don't know how we got on the subject. And I told her, I said, well, you know, babies are born with a sin nature. And she found that incredulous. She's like, oh, I just I don't believe that. I said, well. Do you have children? And she said, yes, I, I, I have children. I said, well, good, because then I can prove it to you. I said, um, have you ever had where your child wasn't quite old enough to walk, but they were able to stand up on things, I mean, grab things and hold on to things to hold themselves up like a coffee table or something? She said, yes. Okay. I said, let's say you were talking to somebody and you had some keys or something you didn't want the baby to have because it was sharp and they could hurt themselves. And they're standing there wobbling, holding on to the table. And you take the keys away from them. And you know they know what no means because you've told them a no a thousand times already. By this time, maybe they're six or seven or eight months old right in there. And you tell the baby no and you pull the keys away. You slide them away far enough out of their reach. And they're looking at you and they're looking at the keys and they're looking at you and they're looking at the keys and you're talking. And the baby, when, when he or she thinks you're not looking, starts scooting over there and reaches for the keys. And you look back and go, I see you reaching for those keys. What are you doing? And they laugh. See, they knew they weren't supposed to reach for those keys. You already told them no. And they can't even talk. And they laugh. I said, that's the sin nature. Doing what you want to do <laughs> despite what you know is right to do. And she said, okay, I have to admit, I see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, the, 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 the couple of points that I wanted to um, offer to everybody tonight, and my conclusions with these verses is, one, that um, uh, there was a spiritual death at the fall, and we've inherited this uh, condition of, of, of a dead spirit. We're born dead spiritually. That's the need to be regenerated and have our spirit brought to life. Uh, so we do have a sin nature, uh, and uh, Paul talks about that, of course, the struggle between the, the natural man and the spiritual man. But um, I got uh, uh, a few more points here I wanted to make. But uh, uh, Dave, uh, any, any thoughts on uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 1 through 3? Uh, Ephesians 2. Yeah, I just read those three verses, Ephesians 2, 1, 1 2, and 3. Right, and then, no, that's what um, I was going to say something about the verse, if you notice in, uh, I think it's verse 4. No, wait, where is it? There it is, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. That's the one you mentioned earlier. That's uh, when we get the spiritual rebirth. I, that's when I think God, you know, cancels out that, that spiritual alienation from our sin. And like sister Lisa was saying, 
the kids know, and Paula was even saying it, the kids know that they're doing wrong, and you catch them, and they know right away, instinct. That That's, I mean, people can't deny that, you know? And I, I hear a lot of people try to explain it away, but, you know, you don't have to teach your kids how to how to do something you tell them not to do. They They do it by instinct. And so I think it, you know, I think it just shows that, you know, Jesus makes a lot of sense when he says you must be born again. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. And and you must be born again. And so, uh, you know, God's got to God's got to fix that disconnect. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as the, the first three verses, you know, it's just. Just that all about that reconciliation from what I see, you know, just how Jesus Christ came to reconcile us back into the father. And we, as Paul tells us, we preach the uh, ministry of reconciliation and, you know, it's all about that spiritual rebirth. Mm -hmm. All right. So verses one, two, and three, Ephesians chapter two, at the very end, it says, uh, you were by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. Yes. That's what we were. Every person that is our nature but he says, and you hath he quickened in verse one. So this quickening is something that reverses this uh, uh, sin nature. But so what is it we're naturally like? It says, um, ye walked according to the course of this world. So we're going along with the ways of the world, which are sinful, because that's the way we all are. You are walking according to the prince of the power of the air. So we're pretty much in agreement with the demonic world. Uh, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience. So we're all children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh. This is our natural state, lusts of the flesh, and fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. This is the natural condition of man, and only with this uh, being quickened, uh, is that uh, is that change? So here's the picture again. You have Adam and Eve, body and soul, and the Spirit of God is breathed into them. Now they're a living soul. They rebelled against God, uh, and uh, the Spirit of God uh, separated. They were disconnected from God, left with a dead spirit, and this is their state. This is their state now. With they they have a functioning mind. They can still think and reason. They can all their bodily functions still work, but their spirit is can't function because it's dead now. Now I had a guy, uh, Evan. He has uh, the channel um, uh, uh, Nephilim Free. Maybe some of you know him. He does very good uh, teachings on uh, the um, uh, arguing against uh, Darwinism. Uh, so I will commend him on that. But he was working with me on a on a s series I was doing and. At a certain point, he told me he couldn't work with me. He had to go his separate ways. And it's because I said that we're, we're all born with a dead spirit. As I said, we're kind of zombies. We're the walking dead. And uh, and he was quite offended by, by that. Now, I'm bringing this up tonight is a hangout. And the, the, the teacher was teaching that um, there was no spiritual death at the fall and that there uh, the man does not have a sin nature. And I was in the chat room and I offered these same verses and the, the teacher uh, asked them to explain those verses if, if, if their position was correct, how would they explain these verses? And the, the teacher says they could not explain these verses. They didn't have an answer. However, they felt uh, the problem presented by these verses and in terms of refuting this, there is no sin nature to, with man, um, that that problem was not as great as the other problem. And I said, well, what, what other problem? And they were saying that if man has a sin nature, uh, then that means that a man cannot be held responsible for his sin because he can't help but do it. It's not his fault. And um, I, I want to give Ray's thoughts on that, but I, I, I think I need to clarify the difference between that position and the absolute Calvinist position. Now, the Calvinists are on the acronym TULIP. 
the T is total depravity, and that and many people were interpreted as total inability. Now, what I, what I think the scriptures are telling us is that there, there is the doctrine of total depravity, that every person is born depraved with the sin nature. Uh, if we live long enough, we will begin to sin. Um, so in, in, in that way, can, can we be held responsible if, if we can't help but being sinners because we're born that way? Um, well, the problem with the Calvinists, they, they, they say that total inability means that man does not even have the ability to understand and believe the gospel because a dead person can't do anything. They take this verse that where uh, it says, uh, uh, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. So the Calvinist says, well, see, you're walking around dead. Uh, well, I don't know why they say you're walking because if a dead man can't do anything, how could we even stand up and walk? Obviously, a, a person who's dead uh, spiritually can still walk and talk and think and reason and all these things we're still capable of doing. So this is where the Calvinist goes so far to, uh, to argue that because we have our dead spiritually and we have a sin nature, then they conclude that it's impossible for us to understand and believe the gospel unless God regenerates you first. I don't know if you're not aware of it, the Calvinist position is not that we believe and then our spirit is quickened and brought to life. They believe that it's the reverse order that God brings our spirit to life and then we will believe, and we're not able to believe unless God first brings our spirit to life. So we have to basically be born again before we can believe is the Calvinist view, in case you're not aware of it. Uh, so uh, that's the, that's where I'm what I'm getting to here tonight. Uh, so any any feedback on on that? Um, I don't necessarily not agree with that uh because i think it probably um the quickening and the true belief the saving unto the soul is probably uh two sides of the same coin um but the 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 way the calvinists have it is that not everybody <laughs> has that and that's just um but they take it to a point where saying that um you know we we can't do good we can't choose right we we don't have the ability to not sin that's not true that's not true all the sins i committed before i knew there was a god and believed there was a god i had a choice i knew what i was doing my conscience was bothering me but it's easy to sear your conscience when there's no god and you just override it with your brain uh but i had a choice i knew what I was doing, and it was my choice, so that part's not true. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, now we know that Jesus uh, was able to live a perfect sinless life, uh, but we don't know of anybody else. The only one else in the Bible that uh, I know of that was kind of said to be perfect is, is uh, well, Melchizedek, which I think is also Jesus, but, but uh, Enoch, uh, but I, I think, the, the church as a whole agrees that, that only Jesus lived a perfect sinless life, that all have sinned. That's the case. If every person sins, do you think it's possible for a person actually to go through their life and not ever sin? No. No. So if it's not possible, how is it? why is it just for God to hold sin against us? This is my point. And so the, the, the problem with the Calvinist conclusion is that uh, God makes certain people believe and, 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 for, and will not allow others to believe because you can't believe unless God brings your spirit to life and makes you a believer is what they say. Uh, I say that if God was making people believe, God would make everybody believe instead of just a few. Right? If, he's, if he's in the business of making us believe and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say that I'd have to become a universal and say God's going to make everybody believe. It would be crazy and unfair and unjust just to make some believe and not allow the others to believe. But I don't think he makes us believe. So therefore, do we have a problem? Is he unjust if uh, 
And this is why I've come to the conclusion when the, book, the Bible tells me that uh, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Um, Brother Luke, can I interject? Uh, uh, can I, let me finish. I was pausing in the middle oh, okay. of the sentence there, and then, then I'll get your thoughts. Um, when he says he's the propitiation for our sins, that means propitiation means that the, the sin debt was completely paid, paid in full for our, for us. And, and us, I think, refers to those who believe. But then the second phrase in the verse says, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So I take the position that on the cross, the sins of all humanity, everybody who's ever lived, believers and non-believers, were put on Jesus on the cross and were paid for. And, and in that way, um, I can say that God is just, because even though uh, man cannot help but sin because it's our nature, we, it's, it's naturally who we are, we're born, we've inherited the sin nature. So it would be unfair if God, uh, you know, uh, held us responsible if we're born as sinners. Uh, the only way God could be just is, well, I'm going to go ahead and solve the problem by paying for everybody's sins because they can't help it. I'll pay for all their sins. Now, does that make me a universal salvation? There's no way. No, I, I don't believe everybody's going to be saved. Uh, only, only maybe 3% of the people are going to be saved, as I said earlier. Uh, but I believe that everybody's sins are forgiven and paid for by Jesus. So what's the problem? The problem is what we said earlier, that, that we're all born um, uh, mortal. We're all with have a sentence of death. We're talking about dying spiritually. Uh, when the, uh, uh, the spirit withdrew from Adam and Eve, they died spiritually, and we're born with dead spirits. Well, and then now we're, if we believe in Jesus, our spirits are brought to life. But the people who don't believe in Jesus, they end up su suffering the second death. That's a judgment. They suffer the second death, which is what Jesus says, the, the complete death. Not just a dead body, not just a dead uh, spirit, but a death of both body and soul in hell. Uh, so um, uh, they, um, they don't have eternal life. Uh, because, but even though their sins have been paid for, they haven't received the gift of life because they would not receive it from Jesus through through faith. Uh, this is how I I've, I've been able to reconcile in my mind that man can have a sin nature, and God is still just because uh, since we can't help but be sinners, uh, He's going to pay for all of our sins. Therefore. For um, it's it's fair and just, and yet not everybody will have eternal life because most people will not receive it. They will not get receive accept the gift because they're full of pride and will not uh, believe in Jesus to get it. Um, all right, let me get anybody's. Uh, we've gone a little longer than we normally would, but uh, I've covered all the verses I wanted to, and, and give me your your feedback on on the verses and and my thoughts. Um, well, since you mentioned the second death, um, I was thinking about it like this. The, the people who go to the second death are part of the, the resurrection of damnation, the Bible calls it. So they're being resurrected because they're physically dead. They're already spiritually dead. So the second death, when they get thrown into the lake of fire, what's dying? It's that last part. It's their soul. And your soul comes from the Greek word psyche, which is your mind, your will, and your emotion. So it's that part of you that's uniquely you. That's what finally dies at the second death is the soul. Because the spirit and the flesh are already dead in these people. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's all I had. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think the actual real death is a complete death. And it, it's permanent. Death of body, soul, and spirit, and uh, you perish. And so, um, uh, but when we die, and then we get resurrected, uh, uh, of course, we 
we have we get the eternal glorified bodies, but we've already got the the soul and 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 uh, spirit of God. So now we're complete. We're three thirds of a person forever. Uh, all right, let's. I guess it's time to kind of start uh, summarizing. Unless there's something else you want to talk about this or anything else before we finish. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just wanted to mention something when earlier when we were talking about the Trinity and how um, you know it, it is kind of difficult to understand three three parts of one, but. Um, when I meditated on it and thought about it, when like a questioning of the Trinity came up several months ago and everybody was like changing and becoming a modalist and strange things were happening. <laughs> I always go to God when those things come up and to ask for clarity. And I thought about my husband. If my husband went on a business trip and he called me every night and I was talking to him, something I might say to him is, I, I miss you, I wish you were here. But I'm talking to him but he's physically not with me so it's only part of him so then i thought about um you know god forbid he ever went into a coma and i'm sitting there by his bedside and thinking well, i miss you where are you well he's physically right there but the other part of him that's his essence is not there so that's how i thought about it you know that for instance a person is three different parts i i could only do it with two because i can't do anything with the spiritual to you know give an example but they're each him his body and when i'm talking to him on the phone and they're all him they're both him and they're each distinctly separately him also and also about um you know sometimes people will say well how come Jesus said, you know, not my will, but thy will be done. Um, and if they're the, you know, one, then why don't they have the same will? Well, it's the same reason of why, you know, your flesh and your spirit, <laughs> there's a conflict. Your flesh wants to do one thing. Your spirit wants to do another thing. They're still both you. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that, that it was brought to mind. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I especially like getting your your um, concept of the uh, two thirds equals six six six. That was very interesting. How because uh, you know six 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 is is contrasted to seven seven seven. That that's the number of the Trinity, the Triune Godhead seven seven seven, and six 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 is the number of man. And so um, it really is uh, amazing how how that works out that this two thirds of a person or 666 is actually the nature of man. I was really, uh, I appreciate that. Um, okay, let me ask, uh, let's everybody start kind of summing up their thoughts. Dr. Luke, I would just remind you that uh, Sister Lisa had something she wanted to add to what you were saying before you had finished last time. Um, oh, so gosh. I was Lisa, what she was gonna thank say. you, thank you, Matthias. Lisa, I apologize. I know oh, you. That's okay, I, brother Luke. I, I put you off. I wanted to finish my 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 thought, and and I forgot to get back to you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please. No, that's that's fine. Um, no, I was just thinking about a verse in Hebrews that uh, I I I don't know. It just came to mind when you were talking about. I'm trying to remember exactly, but I th I think <clears throat> when you were talking about the the. Um, something about the Calvinists and how salvation, how, how do we explain it when salvation is literally offered to the whole world and then somehow God in his sovereignty, you know, is he ordaining, oh, I'm cherry picking, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell, you're not going to go to hell. Um, and I, I know people often get that wrong what they don't understand is that he, because he is God and knows everything, he knows who is going to choose him and who isn't. It's not that he's going around saying, I'm picking you and I'm not picking you. He's not usurping himself um, by saying, I'm going to save you. Because remember, it's his will that none should perish. So if he was going to usurp his will, then nobody would perish. 
-hmm. But the fact remains, he has set it in order that a person has to choose, just like man chose to fall. Man has to choose life. And the only life is in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. But in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him? You know, we, we know there's scripture that said, Behold the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. The plan of salvation is set in order. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. It kind of reminds me of that, um, that, that uh, it's kind of a joke that people tell about a man who was caught in a flood. And I'm sure you guys have heard it, where uh, he's standing on the lawn and the water's up to his knees. And he prays and he said, Lord, please send somebody to save me. And a few minutes later, uh, two guys in a rowboat come by and they say, hop in, friend, we'll take you to safety. He says, no thanks, the Lord will provide. So then a few more hours go by, he's standing on the porch, the water's up to his waist. And he said, I'm thanking you, Lord, you're going to send somebody to save me. And another rowboat comes by. And a, a gentleman says, hop in, friend, I'll take you to safety. He says, no thanks, the Lord will provide. So a few more hours goes by, he's standing on the roof, the water's up to his neck. And a helicopter comes by and lets down the ladder, says, grab a hold of the ladder, we'll take you to safety. He said, no thanks, the Lord will provide. So then a few more hours, he drowns. He comes into heaven soaking wet. He's mad. Clenched fist at God. I don't understand. I was trusting you. I prayed. I waited. God shakes his head. So I don't understand it either. I sent two rowboats and a helicopter for you. So this is exactly what's going on with salvation. He sent provision. It is not his fault if people reject his provision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I like the way you told that. Uh, I, I told that story recently, but I didn't tell it nearly, nearly as well as you did, sister. Um, all right, then. Um, I guess let's each take a, a, a whatever time you need now to kind of sum up your thoughts uh, of the, the talk tonight. Um, I'm sorry that in the beginning I, I had to miss part of it because of the technical problems i'm not even sure what everybody was talking about so uh let's start let's start with uh, brother dave okay give us a little summary of, of your what you think with the talk was like tonight oh man it was it was a good it was full of uh it was full of many gems and i like what uh both lisa and paula had to say about the different topics and especially this last thing that uh sister lisa just said about you know, if, if if God was usurping man's will to save them, then everyone would be saved. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it it's just a lot of scriptural acrobatics that people try to play unnecessarily. God lays it out real simple. Look, we're all sinners. As Sister Paula stated, you know, she didn't have to teach her kids to steal the cookie. You know, God says it. We're all sinners. We need to be reconciled back unto him through his son, the Savior. And we choose to either believe on Christ, as John 3, 18 says, they that believe are not condemned, but they that believe not are condemned already. And it says that men love the darkness rather than the light, but they who do the truth come to the light, that their deeds may be reproved. It's not God saying you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, none of that. It's do you believe and trust that Jesus Christ paid for your sins, and that he will reconcile you back into God and that he will save you. And some people, eventually they humble themselves and they put their trust on him. Or some people think they got it all figured out. They're so full of their own pride and they don't have a clue. And, and it's not, you know, it's just, it's really, really simple. But yet I, it's, it's all this theology and all these debates and all these doctrines and all. And don't get me wrong. Theology is wonderful. Uh, doctrine is, is beautiful. But man, there's nothing better than just being rooted and solid in the core foundational truths of our faith. You, you, you stay steadfast and immovable in those things and all those other theological doctrinal debates can just literally just begin to stress you out. You can just, you know, get involved in them on your own time as you grow in the word, but stay rooted, stay focused on the core foundational truths, and realize how simple God made it. We're sinners. We need a savior. We either trust Jesus or we do it our own way. 
that's literally the options we have in this life that God has given us. But other than that, it was a great show tonight, full of great insight. Chat was active. Um, you know, I, I was encouraged, and uh, it was another good Friday fellowship. Amen. Thank you, brother. I, okay, uh, Sister Paula, you had a lot of interesting thoughts and input tonight. Uh, give me a little summary of what you think. Um, I thought it was great. Uh, I really enjoy this kind of uh, format that you got going on because when there's not really um, – uh, set plan or anything uh, to me I think it gives the Holy Spirit a little more wiggle room you know what I mean mm -hmm. for for someone to bring up something that they've been thinking about or whatever um, <clears throat> it was good to see everybody in the chat I didn't see too many questions um, but I'm glad that you had this on your mind Luke because it really brought out a lot of scriptures that we don't really park on and look at too long and i really enjoy going all through the bible um and a lot of times on these channels it's really hard to get away from the gospel because there are so few people that truly believe uh you know the true gospel by grace through faith so um it's just a refreshment for me it's a <laughs> refreshment of my spirit every friday to come on here with y'all and just to hear everybody's wisdom i love to hear other people's relationship with God just fascinates me. The things he does for them, the things that he teaches them. And uh, I just praise God for y'all and this fellowship. And I think I thought it was wonderful. And thanks. Mm. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, S Sister Lisa, um, it was really a whole great surprise that you could make it. Uh, as I said earlier, I, when I got your message, I. Uh, I wasn't expecting you, so we're all very happy that you could make it after all. And well, what do you what do you have to say about final remarks? Well, I'm glad I was able to make it. It was a lot going on, but I was able to make it. Um, just thinking about uh, tonight and reflecting on the conversation, I think it did probably help some people with regard to some of the more difficult questions that people might have uh, regarding salvation. There are, those were really some pretty tough questions that everyone fielded tonight to answer and try to bring some clarity to uh, understanding um, not only spiritual death and physical death and how it relates uh, in the scripture and according to um, the Lord, what salvation is. Uh, I, I believe that Jesus came to rectify what as it says in Hebrews, with the first Adam messed up, the second Adam corrected. Basically, that's what the book of Hebrews is about if you had to do it in a synopsis. It's all about Jesus, our high priest, and what he has come and done for us and delivered us from the one who has the power of death, Satan, the God of this world. And uh, we have a choice. There, There is a war going on right now. We have a choice whose side we're going to be on. Are we going to choose the Lord, King Jesus, or are we going to choose the devil? And people, believe it or not, they sign up to be in league with the devil. He has them convinced that he's going to beat God, and they believe him. And they're wrong, and they're going to find out the hard way. Um, the Bible says uh, that we're to be of good cheer because he has already overcome the world. We don't see all things put under him right now, but that day is coming. Blessings to everyone in the chat and blessings to everyone on the panel. In Jesus' name, Brother Luke, thank you for having me again. All right. Hey, Sister Lisa, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, You know when you said how the devil has, you know, one-third of them convinced? Have you ever stopped to just try to ponder how anybody could, like, choose Satan? I, I can't wrap my head around it. I think, you know what, one day... Um, I would love for you to expound on that more and hear your thoughts on why you believe some people choose, you know, Satan or how Satan was able to have uh, such influence over the angels. Because it boggles my mind that that, you know, a third of the angels in heaven would follow Lucifer. I, I cannot wrap my head around it. Well, yeah, not only the third of the angels of heaven, but he has deceived men on this earth who who are working 
vociferously to bring Satan's five point plan together that's stated over there in Isaiah. And they're working for it every single day, political make it. And um, it just, it's worked out very well, everything concerning the decision I made. And, and it's not to my surprise, because we're supposed to trust him in everything we do, no matter whether or not we're going left, right, up, down, front, back, side. Uh, right. They, Religiously, everything. Exactly. Economically. Exactly. I, I just, I've really tried to like think about that, you know, that aspect. And I've literally have, I, I cannot wrap my brain around it. <laughs> Excuse me, brother Dave. Okay. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to ponder that so we can get into a discussion on that, but I'm going to throw you a question. I want you to think about when we have this discussion All right. and, that, and that would be, um, didn't you ever wonder why there isn't at least one fallen angel to say you know what bump you devil i'm gonna sit over here in the corner and await my judgment because i ain't gonna make it any worse for myself on judgment day i already done followed your butt and now i'm gonna be judged for it so i'm just gonna sit over here i'm not doing anything you say it's not like the devil can kill him you know right no i'm <laughs> sure there are some but yeah i don't i don't know i cut out earlier and i just wanted to get that out real quick before we closed out the show i I just want to say great show and I appreciate you having me on brother Luke and everybody in the chat. It was, I loved everyone's answers tonight and it was really, really edifying. Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you everybody. Uh, Hendrix wrote, here's a catch phrase for you quote from sinner to winner unquote. Uh, I, I just copied it and saved it on my list of truisms Hendrix. So I do, I will have that matter of fact, I did, did have the list of truisms, those uh, sayings that we want to popularize. I had those available in case we needed to. Uh, I, I intended on trying to insert some of those tonight, but I, I got too focused on the other things. So I, I'm going to try to make an effort to um, uh, continue to repeat those uh, truisms so that maybe everybody else will start repeating them because I think that they're, they're quite profound. Um, all right, I guess it's time to say good night, but I thank everybody in the chat room for being here. Uh, thanks everybody for putting up with me and, and the technical problems uh, and uh, Matthias for bailing, bailing us out again and making it happen. So join, don't forget to join us on uh, Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern for the Church of the Eternally Secure uh, Sunday service. We'll see you all then. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.